So um, thank you all for coming today and joining us. It is hard to believe that it's almost August. I personally can't believe that. I hope that you are staying well and enjoying the ICA virtual conference. Again, a big shout out to the planning committees for what you've done. Um, this is not an easy thing to do and you've put together a wonderful event during difficult circumstances and we appreciate being a part of it. So I know we all look forward to being back together in person soon, um, but we've done a good job of playing the hand we were dealt. So thank you everybody. Today's discussion focuses on staying emotionally healthy and maintaining motivation and creativity. So we'd like to talk about what did we do during the lockdown? What did you do during the lockdown? What can we continue to do going forward now that we're hopefully emerging out of this or at least having this whole thing take different shape? So the panelists today are all musicians with additional training and experience in the health and wellness field. So I'd like to have a quick introduction of each of them now. So we'll start with, with Catherine. Well, um, I am the clarinetist uh, and executive director of the Orion Ensemble. We'll be in our 29th season, and uh, we are located in Chicago, uh, the Chicagoland area. And um, I have been teaching uh, privately and in universities and at, in public schools for 40 years. Um, I was principal clarinet in the Lake Forest Symphony for 33 years, uh, but it's now folded after this, when COVID started, the orchestra did not make it. So um, I have been uh, just doing what everybody else is doing, just keep practicing and performing. And um, we were doing live stream uh, series last year for our chamber music series, so. Really? Hi, I'm Aileen Raisi. I'm Assistant Professor of Clarinet at Universe, Kutztown University in Pennsylvania and Lecturer of Clarinet at Ithaca College in New York. And my side hustle for about the last 10 years has been teaching um, group exercise and in particular Zumba classes. Kathy? Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Mulcahy. I'm the Director of Woodwinds and Assistant Professor of Clarinet at George Mason University. Uh, in Fairfax, Virginia. And my, um, I guess, as Aileen called it, my side hustle is teaching yoga. And so um, I've been doing yoga for, oh my goodness, like about 20 years. I've been involved in practicing yoga. And about four or five years ago, I decided to become certified as a teacher um, because I was giving informal classes to my students um, at George Mason all the time. They were asking me for yoga classes just to help deal with stress and performance anxiety. And so now I teach classes at George Mason, but I also do seminars. Um, I've done a lot of Zoom seminars in the last year um, on yoga for the performing artist. That's awesome. Um, I am Mary Ann Brenneman. I am living in Raleigh, North Carolina from the Detroit area originally. I am a certified health and wellness coach. I own a company called Mindful Health and Harmony based here in Raleigh. It's a wellness practice which is geared towards coaching teens and their parents. Um, I have been a clarinetist and educator for over 30 years um, from middle school to high school to college uh, teaching and I have just finally found a way to blend the, the things that I'm most passionate about. So. I think we have a really good panel here today. I'm excited to hear what my colleagues have to say. So just a little housekeeping before we begin. We have about 60 minutes total today. So we'll be addressing these topics within the panel, but we'll also be watching for questions or comments in the chat. And I, I guess there's a Q&A function as well. So hopefully at the end, um, we'll be able to address anything that we didn't hit while we were in the specific question. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen right now so everyone sees the questions. There we go. So we will go ahead and have the panelists answer the questions or discuss this topic in the order that they introduce themselves. So just keep an eye on it and go ahead and, and talk with us. Okay. Um, I, during COVID, I just decided right away that I needed to keep our chamber music uh, group going as executive director um, I just really felt like we needed to find a way. And so what we did is w we have three venues, uh, one in Evanston, one in downtown Chicago, and one in the far west suburbs in Aurora. And um, the Chicago venue was really set up to do live stream. They've always done that, and I, and I actually thought that this was all, almost a miracle that they had 
um, set this up a long time ago. It's a small venue, but um, we were able to do every concert that we uh, had planned for this, uh, this season. We just shortened the programs and we didn't have any guests. Um, so I, what I did uh, besides um, just continue to plan performances, I did some jazz uh, performances with my daughter who's a jazz uh, uh, vocalist and her boyfriend's a jazz guitarist and we did some Facebook Live stuff. Um, and I kept teaching, I, you know, I'm sure all of you can uh, relate to the first Zoom uh, clarinet lesson or session that you did and you were like, wow, this is really cool. And now, uh, you know, more than a year later, we're like, we're so used to it that it's become a tool and I think it had opened up so much. I mean, without Zoom uh, lessons, I wouldn't have been able to teach at all. Um, and then what thing, what were the things I thought would work but didn't and things that I was skeptical that ended up being great. Um, I, I mean, I actually thought in teaching that it, it, I wasn't sure if it could work at all because I, I didn't know how I would hear the students, but I, I bought a, a very good uh, microphone and, and I had my students do the same. Um, and once they got uh, set up, we got a lot done. And um, I don't know, the pandemic habits, I, the only thing that I, that I just keep, pra I just kept practicing. I never changed that. There was not a day that I, I thought, oh, well, it's a pandemic, so now I'm not going to play my clarinet. I mean, it was like, wow. I'm just gonna keep doing what I doing it doing and keep making it um, my my passion is not changed just because the world is different and I feel like um, in teaching that I was able to help my students um, stay motivated to to continue their growth and also our chamber music group continued um, to um, have our high school partners uh, we did we coached chamber music online at the two high schools that we had planned uh, to to work with the previous year and we were able to work with somewhere around 70 or 80 uh, high school uh, students in chamber music groups all through last season so I thought that was um, quite an accomplishment because what we saw were students that really looked, you know, kind of sad a lot, but in working with them, um, they livened up and uh, we received a lot of positive feedback from the teachers that we partnered with, so. My turn, I think, yeah, okay, great. Um, I'll kind of answer this a little bit out of order. I think I'm in the same boat with Catherine and the things that I was skeptical of, of this whole idea of teaching music online. How do you possibly do it? But I think there are a lot of really fascinating and creative things that, that I came up with to, to work with my students and that my students kind of created on their own, um, whether it was composing or arranging or putting things together on social media. I think a lot of really creative ways to put music out into the world. Um, came out of, of the whole pandemic. Um, things that I did to keep myself practicing, um, I think pre-pandemic, I just had this long laundry list of pieces I wanted to learn, books I wanted to read, recordings I wanted to read, and there was never enough time to do any of that. So finally, not having to be in a car for hours a day to get back and forth from work, I think I took a lot of that extra time. Um, and I I bought all of these method books that I really wanted to work on. I really honed in on the skills in my own practicing that I have always wanted to work on. And now I finally had that practice time to put a lot of um, mindful time into it. And I, I 
bought a whole bunch of recordings that I always wanted to study. And I took a lot of time to do that. Um, I think outside of clarinet, the same thing happened. There were museums that I wanted to go check out. There were books that I wanted to read. And um, finally, I just said, okay, now's the time to go to these online book talks or go to the virtual exhibits for, for these museums and just find things that I have always loved doing outside of music that influenced me as a human, but also influenced my, my creativity and my musicality. Um, one kind of, I guess, larger philosophical thing that kept me going in my, in my practicing and my teaching is this idea of knowing what my why is. So if you've ever seen Simon Sinek's TED Talk on finding your why, um, this is where I got the idea from. If you haven't seen it, it's really, really fantastic. Um, I think a lot of the time during um, lockdown, I was questioning myself, how am I supposed to be an influential mentor and musician when I'm online, doing this stuff online and not making music in person? But when I came back to my specific why, like Simon Sinek talks about, it reminded me of, okay, this is why I have to open up the computer and this is why I have to keep going today for, for that human connection or for building something through music, regardless if we're in person. Um, or not. Um, the pandemic habits that I think um, I will keep, definitely continuing this long list of, of pieces I want to learn, people I want to meet, um, sessions I want to go to, and I think being, um, listening to everything here on the virtual clarinet fest is a good way of doing that because I now have my list of, of everything that I want to learn. So I'll definitely keep up with that. Um, and I know we'll talk about self-care a little bit later, but I, I made self-care a priority during this. So um, that's definitely a pandemic habit that, that will continue after this. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I, I, a lot of the things I would like to say are probably similar, but I'll, I'll just go through this list and see if I have a few um, other things to contribute. Um, I think, you know, when we were first talking about doing this panel, it was even a little bit earlier, um, you know, when we were still sort of really in the throes of the pandemic. And it's been interesting to me how sort of um, my motivation and my coping skills have evolved and changed throughout this whole time. So I would say um, when it first started and we had to teach on Zoom, it was pretty rough. And I'm sure a lot of you had similar problems where the audio, you know, we didn't all have our mic shed and the audio wasn't um, reliable. And so one of the things that I had my students do was record themselves a lot more and send me recordings during that time because we were having so much connectivity you know, so many issues. And I found that was such a great tool for them. And they were surprised at first they, you know, make, I made them do some recordings each week for their lessons. And I think at first they were very reluctant and they're just like, oh, this is such a chore. But what we all realized is they all improved so much from having the recordings. Of course, I was always telling them to record themselves, but I know they didn't do it as much as they should have. So um, that's something that they were doing more of. And I guess I'll kind of jump and say that's a pandemic habit that I'm keeping for my students, checking in with them and making sure they are recording themselves. And also, in addition, I started recording myself more with my practice sessions and listening to my basics and my intonation. And I went back to playing more with drones and experimenting a bit with equipment even because I didn't have those concerts that pressure those performances coming up. And so I tried to turn that into a positive thing. Um, and so that's kind of how I stayed motivated. And my students, again, that was a surprising benefit was that they realized how important recording really is to their playing. Um, I would say now, to be honest, I'm a little burned out on um, <laughs> like live streaming and not playing for audiences. And so now I'm just starting to get excited. I have some concerts coming up in the fall and I'm actually just getting excited about preparing for those concerts and knowing I'm gonna be playing for an audience again. So that's keeping me going now. And um, just, I'm really looking forward to that. And then the, oh, uh, let's see, the skeptical part. I would say Zoom, I was very skeptical of it at first, but for many of my students, it ended up working very well. Um, for those that it didn't work well, we were able to do some in-person lessons this year and that really kept me going. Um, I think seeing how happy the students were when we finally could do in-person again um, made us all more appreciative of the opportunity to play for each other and have that human contact. 
So um, I think just, as I said, the pandemic habits are going to be to continue really working on my basics, recording myself and remembering to take my own advice that I give to my students all the time, that maybe sometimes I don't follow as well as I should. And I know, again, we'll talk about self-care again a little bit later. That's awesome. Thank you, Kathy. So for me, I kind of did everything you all did. Um, I pulled out the old method books and the old technique books that I hadn't used in a long time and went back and played things and got my fingers the way I wanted them to be and had time to experiment with equipment, just like everyone talked about. Um, I put myself on a 100 days of practice challenge because I was certain that we were going to be out of this pandemic in 100 days, right? <laughs> and um, they told us we would be. And um, I ended up going 463 days in a row before I took a day off. And it was it was great. I put my students on like 30 day, 45 day challenges because a lot of my students tend to be younger. Um, I played duets with my trumpet player husband. I mean, there's nothing funnier than than a like bass clarinet and cornet duets after a couple of glasses of wine. It was really our entertainment for for some nights. It was kind of fun. Um, you know, for me physically, I have to work out. I like to do that. So I was enjoying the streaming classes since I couldn't go to my pure bar studio. Um, so I did I did that. And we've got golden retrievers that need to be walked. So physically, I was able to keep myself doing these things, which I know sort of falls into self care a little bit. Um, what I thought would be would work that didn't I thought zoom would be easier than it was. Um, then I realized the things that Kathy said, you know, the microphones, the settings, the, you know, the whatever's you can't play with your student. And then we just made it work. Um, I work with a lot of middle school and high school kids, and a lot of them are not necessarily as confident playing by themselves as they are if I'm sitting next to them playing with them. And what I found that was a good thing was that they ended up actually growing in their confidence because it was like, look, we don't have any other way to do this. You have to play and you have to play it by yourself and they would just rise to the challenge. So they were they were really good about that. Um, I was fortunate in that I have a, a renovated garage that's very, very nice. And I was able to put um, lessons together back in person. I could keep the students 18 feet away from me and keep a garage door open and um, we would sanitize the stand between lessons and we would shift coming in and coming out and I started teaching um, in person again in June of 2020 so that worked out really well for me anybody who wasn't comfortable um, they stayed online and that was fine and we all just went on the honor system if anyone had been exposed or didn't feel well we just assumed that it was a bad thing and we shouldn't be near each other and we would go to zoom and we so we did that and it was it was really great but as far as pandemic habits, I mean, all these things that I meant to do before, I'm keeping some element of them because as Aileen said, like there's all this stuff that we mean to do and we're just too busy to do it. And then I thought, you know, I want to do these things. So I'm going to figure out how to do these things. So that's kind of the way I handled the, uh, the difficulty. So let's move on to self-care because that's important. And, uh, and I think we figured that out, that to stay healthy, you have to do a certain amount of this. So let's go back to the top of the order then and hear what Catherine has to say. Okay. Well, um, I didn't mention um, that I wrote a book on, on uh, healing and building optimal health with nutrient-dense foods. And I spend a lot of, uh, I've spent more than 20 years um, getting my food from farms, uh, local farms and uh, co-ops. So my self-care routine is, is pretty routine in a, in a way, just because we always, I always go and pick up my uh, grass-fed foods, uh, raw milk at the farm. I have a co-op and a farm. So for me, um, my wellness starts with what I eat. And I, I mean, I cannot imagine not eating whole, uh, sourced from really good sources food every day. And that I feel, um, even though before I started doing this, I, I had gotten very ill and, and actually nearly died. So I wrote this book, Performance Without Pain, on my journey to to wellness and um, it's been, I actually spoke at the uh, International Clarinet Association conference, I'm thinking about maybe eight years ago, 
or maybe more. I it's hard for me to remember, but the book came out in 2006, but I was um, better. I, I got sick around 2002. I had severe digestive disorder and chronic pain. I'd had chronic pain for 25 years, and I now have no pain, <laughs> and I don't have any digestive problems whatsoever. So for me, again, self-care is all about, first, nutrition. Secondly, um, I, I spend time meditating uh, every day. I mean, I don't spend like a half an hour even, but I spend some time uh, doing that. And I feel that, that and I, I do a lot of spiritual uh, reading, reading things that are, help me in my meditation. And um, I, I just feel like just go, 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 go is not a good place to really be balanced. And between the, the foods that I eat and um, the meditation that I do, and then daily exercise, uh, I, I think we've been mentioning that, I walk every day, I have two little dogs. Um, I feel that I can go to my practicing with a positive attitude just because I feel good. And I feel good because I've made the decisions to do the things that I know work for me personally to stay as healthy as possible. Um, and so with my students, um, I'm all, I am sharing, I have a book to share, uh, I have a book on acid reflux to share with actually people around the world by it, especially professional singers who, who, who have trouble with that. Getting to a whole foods diet, um, I, share, I share my knowledge um, with people literally all over the world. Um, and I, I feel like when you come from a a base of eating really good whole foods and you're working on your uh, self in other areas, when you go to play your clarinet, you're, you feel better and you're able to stay motivated because you feel good. So I think that's my motto is if you feel good physically, it's easier to stay motivated Taking care of yourself is like putting oxygen on yourself first and, you know, the plane, and then you can help everybody else. 100% oh, what Catherine said, and I think that links to something that I always tell my students, and that if you can be the best you first, then you can be the best student, then you can be the best clarinet player you can be, then you can be the best researcher, but really, truly, you're the most important. So if you take care of your body and you take care of your mind, then that's going to leak into every other aspect of your life too. Um, I think probably when I was a, a student in undergrad and I heard the word self-care, it was kind of a, a new coined term, I guess, at that point. And I kind of looked at it as a reward for getting the things done. So if I got everything done in the day, then I could go I don't know, out with friends and eat pizza and relax after. Um, but that's that's changed quite a bit in the last few years. And I really love the term. If anyone was in um, Melena and Megan's session earlier today, they used the term self-preservation. And I, I love that because you're you're preserving yourself. You're preserving your mind and body through doing things that that help you. So I think when um, when lockdown started, I wanted to do everything I could possibly do to not get sick. So um, I ate pretty healthy before, but I actually made time to sit down and eat a hot meal every single day and to make sure that I got all of my vitamins and nutrients from my food. Um, I have finally got enough sleep or, or just more sleep than I had gotten previously. And I made sure in my schedule every day that I had some form of exercise, whether it was yoga or dancing or going out for a run. Um, and those are definitely things that um, I'm 
I will continue to do. And those are all things that I encourage my students to do too. So part of my, my studio classes or my rep classes when I had all of my clarinet students together was doing exactly this, taking time to meditate or letting them out a few minutes early and asking them to go for a walk and take care of their body. Um, so these, these aspects of life always came into what we were doing in clarinet and, and in lessons as well. Um, so it's interesting listening to everyone talk. I think I will be totally honest. And, um, I, during the lockdown, I actually felt like I had less time and made less time for myself and started getting into some less good habits. And it's been an interesting journey. I think especially my last semester, last spring, was especially rough for a lot of reasons for me. I was, I don't live far from my school. I live 15 minutes away, but I was trying to combine teaching in person and on Zoom because we were able to do some in person, but scheduling was tough because the room restrictions were very, um, there were only certain rooms we could use because of distancing and airflow, et cetera. So I was, regularly driving from my house to school and back each day. So I'd like teach it at school, bring all my stuff with me because I didn't, my office, um, I didn't really have an office this year. <laughs> Our rooms were just all messed up. So I would, you know, grab all my stuff, drive to school, teach a class or teach a lesson, drive back home, run up to my office and teach on Zoom. And it, I didn't expect it to be as exhausting as it was, but in retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have tried so hard most of my colleagues either chose one or the other a lot of them just stayed home because it, you know it was just too exhausting to do what i did and i realized maybe it wasn't the best choice even though my students greatly appreciated the in-person instruction um i also had have a 12 year old at home who was struggling with in with um online learning and then did go back to school part-time but that was stressful um and my husband had shoulder surgery he's a trombonist and so he was kind of <laughs> in need of, I had to take care of him during all this. And so what happened to me, it's a story that we hear a lot, is I actually stopped taking care of myself. I was so busy taking care of my daughter, my husband, and my students who I felt like really did need me to prop them up and give them a lot of advice. That depleted me so much. And instead of doing the things that I should have been doing, like keeping up my yoga practice, um, I just felt so exhausted that I would just like take a nap or just watch some TV. Um, and by May, I was not feeling good. And it was because I wasn't doing all the things that I've learned over the years that I need to do and the things that I tell my students they should do. You know, I wasn't following my own advice. So I have really dedicated this summer to my self care and to making sure that I really de rededicate myself to um, I've been, you know, walking my dog a lot, hiking, doing yoga. I've had that time. And um, I know that it's something that I'm, as we start up in August, that I will make time for again. So I guess I'm just sharing to be completely honest that I, I found myself in a really not great spot, especially this last spring. Um, but I'm feeling great now and remembering what I need to do so that I can still feel good and really be there for my students and not be so depleted, uh, which is what happened. I will say um, I was doing some Zoom yoga classes for my students and they really enjoyed that. And I did enjoy that as well. Um, in studio class, as Aileen said, we spent time just to chat, to visit um, more than we would normally do because they really needed that social interaction. And, and I really did enjoy that. And I feel like I got to know more about them in some ways, because they were in their homes, we got to know each other's pets really well. That was kind of fun. Um, just some like fun personal things about them that I didn't know. So I guess that's my story. Maybe it's a little bit different than some of everyone else's, but I, I will be honest that I struggled a lot during this time. And I do feel like during this transition, I'm coming out of it and feeling a lot better. So um, anyway, I will pass it on to Marianne. That's awesome. Thanks, Kathy. I struggled too. I mean, I, I think most people struggled in some way or another. Um, you know, at first it seemed like, okay, I've got, a, I've got a month to clean the house and to get my stuff organized and to get some practicing done. And then as it dragged on and people were getting sick and it was getting scary and we were starting to miss everything we enjoyed doing and wondering what the new normal was going to be like. I had some anxiety issues um, and it was, it was difficult and, and finding good, mental health resources, finding a therapist during a pandemic is difficult too, because 
so many people were having issues that it was very hard to get uh, to get a therapist to talk with. Um, I had an issue finding one for myself and I finally did find one, but I've been meditating for years and, you know, that has really been a lifesaver for me um, to the point of where during the pandemic, I actually did an online certification course to become a meditation instructor because it was helping me. I mean, some days I really wasn't handling things well at all. And I can't imagine what I would have been like had I not had that in my toolbox to kind of help myself with it. So I start every day. 10 to 15 minute meditation. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it doesn't have to be like much. So I do 10 to 15 minutes. It's made a huge difference for my anxiety level. I also, before I start teaching, I'll do a short meditation or breathing exercise then because I find that it focuses me, it settles me down and it changes my energy. So if I come into a room or come onto a Zoom lesson and I'm anxious, my students feel that and if they're anxious you know it's just making everything worse so i make sure that my energy is in check before i go work with other people and that's that's made a big difference i also ask their parents because remember i primarily teach middle school and high school i ask their parents if they would be comfortable with me teaching their kids some meditation um options and some breathing exercises and they all said oh my gosh please do that they really need it so that was really helpful we would do um a body scan meditation it takes like a minute and a half to two minutes at the you know at the beginning of a lesson it, we'd start at the top of their head and have them relax with their eyes closed all the way down and they'd be like oh i do have my tongue at the roof of my mouth and my shoulders were up here and my face was tight like there are things that we just got used to that they hadn't noticed before so that was really helpful um i i'm big on positive affirmation meditations um for everybody, but but definitely for kids, they were struggling so much. So that was that was what I did. And um, and to echo what everybody else has said so far, I'm a huge whole food advocate. I, I eat very, very clean. I drink a lot of water. Um, I know that people joked about the, the COVID-15, how everybody gained weight. Um, you know, I just made sure that I didn't change what I did in that regard. I, I ate the food that I usually eat, which is good. I did the exercise. Some days I didn't feel like it, but I did it anyway. And because um, I didn't want to get sick. And I and I know that, you know, that how you treat your body has a, a lot to do with whether you're going to get sick or not. So so that was what I did. And that's I'll just leave it at that because we're going to move on to the next slide, which is about mindfulness and breathing. Um, and, and I'm going to go out of order here. I'd like to I'd like to address this first and then throw it back to, to Catherine. Um, since I already addressed what I do meditation wise, what I want to ask you all to do is to please stop multitasking. I know that that's the way we've been taught and the, the way busy people get things done and whatever. But that was another thing that I did during the pandemic was I learned to monotask and I did some research as to why multitasking is really not the best way for us to do things. You'll do a task faster and better if you focus on one thing to completion and you'll you'll practice better. You'll you'll retain the information better. Put your phone on. Do not disturb. Get your stuff done. You know, give yourself 20 minutes to look at Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever you like later in the day and or whenever you know as long as you have a dedicated time to do it it doesn't encroach upon what you're trying to do at that very moment and so that was how mindfulness and breathing and centering and focus and all of those things came into play for me you know i i don't do a hundred things well at once i don't even do three things well at once and so when i realized i can take the time to focus on one thing at a time it actually stopped that swirling in my brain that I would feel that would contribute to the anxiety that I was feeling. So it would be interesting to see if, if um, any of you have experience with that. Like if you've tried to stop multitasking and just focus, if your anxiety level has lessened, I would be interested to know that. And that's all I'm going to say before I hand it back to Catherine. Well, I really love uh, hearing you talk about that, Marianne, because um, I have made it a habit to put my cell phone on silent in a room that's far away from my where I'm practicing, and I I just don't go on fake. I mean, I just really tried to spend less time on my cell phone. I did a lot more reading, and I it's like when I started um, just getting the cell phone uh, just away from my daily ha habits and and not 
just not taking calls even when I'm practicing. I, it's just like, it's like, what are we doing? You know, we're just fragmenting ourselves so much. And then I think when um, this mindfulness word, it's just so important because every moment of our day is important. It doesn't matter what we're doing, but if we do focus on what we're doing instead of, like you said, dividing ourselves, um, thinking about what I have to do later, what I did yesterday, well, no, what are we doing now? How, how are we, um, how are we focusing on our uh, instrument as we're playing? The breathing, you know, clarinet is like, I don't know, like oh, so Olympic with breathing. And I, I mean, just, in, just focusing on the breath and then, you know, like just getting out of the way of the mind, just fragmenting to other things and staying, staying uh, motivated to improve whatever piece we're working on at that moment. How can we make it better? Through just mindfulness and breathing alone. That's gonna center and focus you. I mean, it's it's also every day of our lives, the whole day. It's not just for clarinet. And so I I love um, that you're you brought that out right away. And um, I think what COVID is probably done the gift it's given us is to become more simple in our lives so we know not only simplify our lives but also realize what's really important and so it's kind of like every moment is really important and i think it's easier for me to stay um happy and peaceful when i and just taking one thing at a time, just like what you, you said, one thing at a time. And that's all that matters right then. Really putting all my energy into, if I'm teaching, I'm really, really focused on my student. I'm not focused on what I'm gonna do after the, the lesson. How can I help this person? Uh, being of service to the, the all of, the students and the people we touch in our daily lives. When you're going on a walk, appreciating who, who you run, you know, who you meet along your walk. And I, I just think that it, the mindfulness aspect of um, our lives is, it's, it's just like the thing that will help us to be who we really are meant to be. So that's my thing. I love that Catherine said, everything is really important and every moment is really important. Um, and I, I'm a big proponent of that, that time is so, so precious. And I think when you, when you make a list of the things that are so important to you, time becomes even more precious because you wanna spend time with the people that you love doing the things that you, you really, really love. And if we're thinking about 500 million other things, when we're trying to spend time with that one person or doing something that we really enjoy, then we lose out on, on that connection in the moment, whether it's with a person or doing an activity. Um, I, I had a colleague that had said to me, um, now is all there is. And I think that's really true. You can, you can be fully present and, and be in the now. And some ways that I kind of, um, have worked on that, especially during the pandemic was, um, just keeping a, keeping a schedule, putting in all of the things that I, I have to get done that can't be changed throughout the day, but also putting in my schedule, the things that I love and making time for those, whether it's calling somebody or, or working out or making food. Um, but also on that schedule is a little spot for me, especially during my practice sessions to write all of those thoughts down that jump in my head when I'm practicing, because I know if I don't write down, if I'm 
I don't know, playing something and it reminds me of a, a mentor that I need to send an email to. I know if I don't write it down, I'm either going to think about it my entire practice session, or I'm just, I'm not going to remember to do it. And then I'll feel bad because I forgot to do it. So um, that's my, my biggest thing. I have sticky notes all over and I have my planner that just have these notes so that I don't have to keep anything in my head. There are too many other things to remember than, than a to-do list or something that I did yesterday or something that I need to do tomorrow. Um, yeah, and, and, and this idea that Marianne had talked about with so many thoughts just swirling around in, in your head, usually that happens to me during practicing because that's the one moment that I get by myself and to, to have these kind of thoughts. So um, just spitting them out on paper has been a, a huge help for me. Over to Kathy. Yes, thanks, Aileen. So I definitely, um, one of my new habits that I've employed that I often have given the advice again to my students is using a timer when I'm practicing. Um, I'll tell them to do that when, you know, sometimes they'll say, I just some days, I just don't feel like doing it. And how do you, you manage? And, you know, I've talked to them about say, you know, say you have to do long tones for 15 minutes, just set your timer for 15 minutes and, and you'll be able to do it. So one of the things I was able to do when we were talking about being more mindful and focusing on what we're doing some days, because like I said, I had all these um, family obligations and, you know, I just felt like everyone needed something from me. I would come up to my practice room and just say, okay, I'm setting my timer. So my phone would be in the room with me, but not on my stand, but I do not disturb. Just say I'm setting it for 30 minutes and I'm only going to practice for 30 minutes. And that did help me to set aside that time mentally and say, this is just for me and I'm just going to do this. And I think when we're drawn in a lot of different directions, as I am in this time in my life, and many of us are, um, we just find our ways to be able to be in the moment and be more mindful. And I've been also using my timer on my phone for all kinds of things like cleaning my house, which I, I love the result, but I don't love the process. And so I've been learning that I can get quite a lot done. Even if I say in for 20 minutes, I'm going to straighten up my office. It's amazing how much I can get done. But in those 20 minutes, I'm not allowed to look at my phone. I'm not allowed to you know, check social media, answer messages. But what I do have is a bullet journal, which is, um, it's just like a hand, you know, it's, it's in a notebook like I have, it's right here. And so my planner is all on paper and all written, not on my phone, which I know a lot of people think like my husband does everything electronically he's like why do you use paper and pen but it's exactly what aileen was saying so i have this open and then when i'm in the middle of one of those sessions where i've got my timer and i'm trying to really focus if i have thoughts or anything i just write in my bullet journal and then i'm not getting on my phone to put a little reminder and then accidentally looking at something i shouldn't be so um I've talked a lot to my students about the techniques that I've learned and, and some of them have shared techniques with me. I think that's something we've talked about a lot more this year than we had in the past is different techniques that we're using to cope with anxiety, mindfulness, focus. Um, definitely in my yoga practice, I incorporate breathing, exercises and meditation. I always join the two together with my yoga practice. And I find um, even if I'm spending five minutes doing a little meditation like it takes so little time it's amazing how much of a benefit there is um so definitely as we go forward i think i'm going to keep my rule of if i'm having trouble focusing just setting that timer and breaking things into little chunks it's, it's very helpful to me um and also making sure something that i don't take for granted as much as i used to is seeing friends in person and this summer i've been making time to see people and get together. And sometimes I feel during school, I don't do that because my life just gets taken over by my schedule. And that's something I've pledged to myself to do is to make time for social interaction and connection in person. Um, something that we all really missed. That might be a little bit off the topic, <laughs> but those are the things that have just helped me to be able to function and stay focused and be able to you know, practice and, and again, just not feel so scattered and feel like my mind is just swirling. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything. So maybe turn it back over to Marianne. I think that's awesome about the timer. I do that too. And I'll put the phone on do not disturb and I'll set the timer for 30 or 45 minutes and be like, 
you're practicing for 30 or 45 minutes and you're not stopping until that duck quacks, you know, it's, it's kind of the way it goes. And I know I can look at the social media later and that I haven't missed anything. You know, that's, that's the thing. We all get the stupid FOMO, the fear of missing out, you know, it's, and it's, it happens quickly. Like you don't realize it's happening. And then all of a sudden you're kind of attached to your phone. So, um, so I really appreciate that. I'm going to move it along to creativity during COVID and after COVID. And we've sort of already talked a bit about this, but I do want to ask about um, how you felt it affected your creativity. I, I mean, and again, I'm going to go out of order because I'm here right now and I, I, I know that feeling of having too many tabs open and like that swirling that we've talked about. Um, and so for me, the theory behind meditation is that it quiets your mind, obviously. And for me, if my mind is quiet, I feel like I get the answers. I get the inner guidance. I get the divine guidance. That's kind of, we all subscribe to different things. But for me, if I'm quiet, I can hear what the universe is telling me. You know, you know that might sound a little little woo-woo to some of you, you, you people. But for me, I, I like that. And I feel if I can just calm the heck down for a little bit, I'll get the answers that I'm looking for. You hear people say they do their best thinking in the shower when they're not thinking about or doing something else, you know, they're just, so there's a saying, and you've all heard it when somebody says, don't just stand there, do something. I love the reverse of it, which is don't just do something, sit there. And that's, I, every time I'm going crazy and I can feel it, I'll be like, Marianne, you're doing it again. Don't just do something, sit there. And that brings me back to where I need to be. And that's how I get my clarity and my creativity. And now I will hand it over to Catherine to talk about how she gets her creativity. Well, I just love what you just said. It, that's, I think we're all on a journey. I think that is very creative. And I think, um, I mean, my granddaughter, I, I take a lot of pe care of people in my home as well. And my granddaughter is at our house a lot and she could not go to zoom kindergarten i mean <laughs> that just didn't work out but so i asked for it in my heart like what are we going to do i did homeschool her but then i found i connected with um an incredible group of people and now we're uh with a homeschool co-op but it was through quieting myself that i added that to my life and I found a whole new group of people that are now very important to me um, and I've also I do a lot of activism for different things and um, I connected with them in that way I just I feel that what's great about being a musician and what I notice about the students that I have and and all my colleagues is that because we spend so many years by, we, we spend so much time by ourselves, um, we do learn to listen to our spirit, what it's, what it's telling us. And it might not have anything to do with music. There's so many things that we, we can do. And we're, we just by opening the door, like what, what can I do about this problem? And the creativity comes through us because we're more open to solutions because we've been solving every single tiny little problem playing the clarinet since we were nine by our, you know, with our teachers, but by ourselves in a room, which is kind of like meditation in itself. So I feel like being a musician has helped me be more open to the universe asking me, you know, like I am asking too, like what, where is there a need for me, for my, where, who, what should I do about this problem? And it's not all about music every little minute of our lives. It could be so many things. and. I'm just grateful that I, I have the opportunity to, um, to branch out into doing other things besides playing the clarinet and everything that I do in, it strengthens my musical um, expression, I feel, because I'm expanding who I am on the planet. And uh, so I just, 
am grateful that I'm a clarinet player and I've learned so much about the power of being a positive uh, role model on this planet and that I'm not only doing one little thing I'm doing many things with the same um, expression and um, joy that that I started doing in fifth grade sitting down with the clarinet and nobody could pull me away from that practice room so <laughs> that's what I do hey Elaine I'm gonna jump in here for a second for the sake of time I think it might make sense if you and Kathy talked about being fitness instructors and how mo movement and motion and exercise affects moods and energy. Would that be okay with you both if we jumped ahead? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think, so I've been a, a Zumba instructor for a little over 10 years and there's definitely been days and I think a lot of people can associate with this where you know you have to work out. So for me, I'm, I'm going to a Zumba class, um, but I also know that I need to go practice and I need to get ready for this performance. And the, sometimes, I hate to admit this, but the last thing I wanna do is go work out at that moment. And then I hear the music and then I start moving. And then it's like, I, I can tackle the whole world. I can do whatever I want during that class and after that class. Um, and I'm always curious on why, why does that happen? What's going on in the brain? Um, so I guess I can like quickly go into the science behind it without getting um, too nitpicky. Um, one, uh, I love TED Talk. So if you wanna check out the TED Talk by Wendy Suzuki, she really talks about um, what are the uh, immediate effects of, of movement and exercise on your brain and what are the long-term effects of, of music and exercise. And I'll, I'll throw out some technical terms, but I'll try my best to explain them a little bit. Um, so during a workout, immediately after one single workout, there's an increase in neurotransmitters. And basically those are um, little molecules that um, transport information between neurons in your brain and from your brain to your body and to your muscles. And some of those neurotransmitters that are increased during exercise are dopamine, serotonin, and um, neuroadrenaline or, or noroepinephrine are the others. So we might have heard of some of those. Um, dopamine is the feel-good transmitter, um, always makes you feel great, like you can tackle anything. Um, no, uh, sorry, dopamine is also responsible for um, decision-making, for planning. So when we have a flood of dopamine during and after an exercise, um, it makes you feel incredibly happy. And it also makes your brain want to repeat that exercise as well. With um, an increase in serotonin, this often stabilizes our mood, um, helps with sleeping, eating, digestion, and helps to regulate anxiety as well. And norepinephrine um, helps with memory, your sleep cycle, your focus. So when we have an increase of that, then we also can often feel an increase of focus. And I think someone on here had mentioned that after the workout, um, they can go through with whatever they had planned for that day. And oftentimes that's associated with exercise, that your focus is, is right on par. Um, and then the long-term effects is that um, exercise actually physically changes your brain. So we have um, two parts of the brain that Wendy, Dr. Suzuki talks about in this TED talk is the hippocampus that's responsible for um, memory and learning. So when we exercise, the volume of the hippocampus actually expands um, and can improve long-term long memory. And then the other part that she talks about is the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for making decisions and for um, expressing your personality. So again, the actual volume of that part of the brain increases. And um, if we develop some sort of habit where we're constantly exercising, it's part of our daily routine, um, you can't necessarily um, stop diseases that, that attack these parts of the brain, but you can slow them down from getting to these parts of the brain. Um, so there's, there's disease fighting agents to exercising, but there's also a lot of these feel good agents to it as well. Um, I know we don't have too much time, but I'm going to do a plug because I've been reading this awesome book called The Joy of Movement um, by Dr. Kelly McGonigal. And she actually talks about a lot 
of why synchronized movement is really great. So maybe um, some people are listening and you're like, yeah, I've tried to exercise, but I just, I can't get into this habit. Um, perhaps you might not be trying the right thing. Not everybody can go out and run a 5k every morning, but um, it might be beneficial to go to a, a group exercise class because when you're with other people and you're moving together, not only does it have those really specific things that are going on between your, your muscles and your brain, but you're also finding a community. And that's a really special thing that, that fitness can do. But also there's so many um, similarities between what we do in music when we're playing with each other and what's going on in the brain as um, when we're exercising. I'll hand it over to you, Kathy. That was awesome, Aileen. I didn't know all of that, th that information, like so scientifically, and I really wanna check out that TED talk. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I think Aileen answered the question <laughs> very well. My the small thing I'll I'll say when that really struck a chord with me was talking about being in a group. And I will say that um, through uh, COVID, I really did enjoy being able to do all the Zoom yoga classes. There were my yoga studio, as many others um, pivoted and had some great content. But I when I went back, I, I didn't go back until this June to um, in-person yoga. And I will tell you that first class I went to where I was in that studio with other people, it was amazing. Like I almost started crying <laughs> to be honest. It sounds a little cheesy, but it was just like being in there together we were, and it was heated. So we we're sweating a little and just like the energy for me, that is what really helps my creativity, my focus. I, I feel like I get so many good ideas during yoga, even though I'm trying to quiet my mind, but just things kind of come and go. And um, that community and that energy is what really does it for me. So I think that's true. If you don't feel like you're, I'm not a runner. Um, I love getting out and walking, but if you're not a runner, if you don't love doing things just on your own, maybe try a group, some kind of group exercise class that the energy we get, that communal energy, it's just, it's, I think it's almost magical, honestly. And I feel like that's really helped me this summer to really heal and start to feel like myself again, being in that community. So that is all I will add. And I know there were a couple of questions. I don't know if we have time for them, but I didn't know if anybody wanted to address those or how we wanted to answer them. We do have time. Um, and I, I just wanna second the whole idea of, a, of group class because I'm a pure bar addict and I was so excited that I was able to do streaming classes, but we were doing them on Facebook. So you could actually see the people that you would normally see in person um, in the, like commenting in the chat. And that sense of community was super, super important for me. Um, let's take a look. Let's see, there's nothing in the chat that looks like questions, but let's take a look at the Q&A. So someone, Sean says, did anyone else try, is it Wim Hof breathing? I hope I'm saying that correctly. And then someone else said, how do you plan a daily practice session if you are working full time and music is your me time? So would anyone like to address those from the panel? Well, I know who you're talking about, William Hoff, William Hoff and he's an amazing man who has done incredible things that, Everybody should read his story. Um, basically really breathing deeply um, and doing an exercise where you're breathing deeply for a while. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong because um, I, I'm, I've just listened to his story and I mean, he could go underwater for a long, 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 long time in icy water, and he he was able to withstand uh, extreme temperatures uh, through this breathing. Um, I mean, it's very impressive, and I think that oxygenating your body with breathing deep breathing exercises is a really good idea. I think it helps every area of your everything in your body, your health, and also your your wind uh, capacity and your focus and your mood and everything, oxygen. So I don't know if anybody else has any comments for that. No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, and then let's, let's talk about that. If, you know, if you work full time and music is your, your me time or your passion rather than, um, you know, your profession for me, 
you know, I think that you just have to schedule it. Like I, you know, I, I schedule almost everything I do. Um, and I'm like Kathy, I write everything down by hand. I, my husband thinks I'm crazy, but I just know for a fact that if I put it all in my phone, something's going to happen to the phone and I'm not, I'm going to lose everything and I'm not going to know where to go. So I have everything written down, but I actually block time for my work and for my other stuff. And so I think if you work full time in another field, you just have to decide how many times a week do I want to practice and for how long and put it on your calendar and don't let anything interfere with it and just make, you know, make that space for you, make it for you and, and have that be your self care. That would be my only advice. And I would also like to add with that, I think sometimes even though my full time job is in music, I sometimes feel like I don't get to play enough because I'm teaching all day long and talking about clarinet all day long. So some nights, if I'm just really exhausted, I give myself permission not to practice. It's OK. Like and as Marian said, think, you know, you don't need to if it's too much, too much pressure on you and it feels too stressful it's okay not to do it every day. Just do it enough that it keeps you fulfilled and keeps you satisfied and, and keeps that going. But I do give myself, um, I try to be compassion, compassionate with myself and kind to myself and know that just maybe some nights I don't have it in me and it's okay. And that's important. Absolutely. And sometimes when you force yourself to practice, you just end up miserable and you feel terrible and you don't play well. And you like, what's the point of that? That's not why we do this. Right. So um, is, is there anything else that anybody would like to talk about? I, I mean, I think we've covered a lot today and I hope that everyone got some benefit from it. It's been a heck of a 16 months, 17 months, whatever it's been too long. I, I hope that we are emerging stronger um, and emerging more compassionate for each other and with more understanding. And I hope that I'm trying to remember who said it. it oh, it was Catherine saying, you know, we are more than just musicians and how we, I mean, being a musician is a wonderful, beautiful thing. But we all have other things that we do and that are that contribute to the world. And I think that it's important to remember those things as well and see if we can blend them together. So is, is there anything else that the panelists or anyone else would like to say before we sign off? Well, I just want to thank everybody for uh, participating on the panel. I had a chance to meet new uh, people doing this, and I'm so glad that we are beginning discussions like this um, because this is the real core of what a community can really be. And I think it's just a start of what's possible because your health is your wealth. It's every part of health. I mean, not just your physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health, all these areas of, of you as a human being we, it's like it's like every part of your body is important. Every part of who you are is important. And as we share with a community about these issues, it's like we found new friends. And so please feel free, uh, any of the people that have joined us today, to reach out to any one of us um, if you have any further questions or um, just if you need some help in, in an area and, and one of us resonated we're, we're here, we're here to help. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you everybody so much. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the festival and we thank you for coming out today. Thank you okay. guys so Goodbye. much. Take care. Bye.